You guys can hear me? Yes, sir. Yes. So uh, we have been a trial with Sanjay lab member, right? Yeah, Dr. Sandhya logged in before, but uh, something happened and she we okay. asked her to log out. Now I sent her the link, she's logging in again. Okay. She is logged in. Can, can you hear us? Yes, I'm I, I'm so sorry. I didn't see that you had sent a new link. I was trying to join through the old one. Yeah, we have okay. we are having some issues with the old. Okay. I mean, okay. It's the same link, but I don't know why. Okay, okay. How are you doing, Sandhya? I'm fine. How are you? Rari? Okay. I think this pandemic. I almost not... didn't recognize you with the mask. Yeah, my office and the lab are connected and I have students in my office, so. Just the usual precaution. Yes. Very nice. Thank you so much for making time for this. Um, yeah, yeah. No problem. This is our first time putting something like this together. And so I think for everybody, I think even for including this new, maybe this could be a new experience, you know, in terms of telling people what we are doing and how we are doing, especially the part that we want yes, to Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. I, I, I mean, so I'm kind of hoping that the afternoon session, my students will give hands on, but yeah. I will constantly talk about how we got where we are and what we are doing. So, it, so I have about 40 odd slides, I think. That's fine. Anyway, and, I'm looking forward to it. Thank you again. Actually, and, no, I have more than 40 slides, but I should finish in, in an hour, I think. Yeah, so yeah. Um, I just wanted to let the students know that if they wish, they can, um, you know, stop me in the middle and ask questions. I don't know how that works on, on the yeah, WebEx yeah. platform. Yeah, the whole thing is done run by students. So they will introduce me now, and then uh, if there is some burning questions, they may interrupt. But preferably, we like to put them, ask them to write okay. in the chat. Okay. okay. If they have so planned it, then they should do yeah, it. Yeah, it's, it's all taken care of. Uh, we like them to compose a proper question and put them in the chat, and one of the moderators will ask. Or if the students are very keen, they raise their hands and uh, we allow them to ask me the people. Yeah. Shall we get started? Yeah. Thank you so much for joining. Okay. Yes, Adios. yes. Uh, so good morning, everybody. Today uh, morning, we would be having a talk by Dr. Sandhya Kaushika. So Dr. Sandhya Kaushika did her BSc in chemistry and master's in biochemistry from MS Baroda University. She did her PhD at Brandeis University and postdoctoral fellowship at Washington University School of Medicine. She's a cellular neurobiologist who ran her lab first at NCBS DIFR and is now at a DBS DIFR. She set up live cell imaging in her lab using C. elegans model system and later attempting other model systems using microfluidics chips that her group developed. She received the HHMI Early Career Scientist Fellowship in 2012 and has engaged in various community building activities like organizing the first two young investigators meeting and first Indian C. elegans meeting. She, is, uh, she was also involved in expanding the NCBS crash and training and mentoring people there. And presently, she is also uh, very actively involved in uh, COVID-19 related science outreach. So uh, this session will be moderated by me, uh, Tanya and Dr. Kartikin. Uh, over to you, Tanya. Thank you, Aksha. Um, I'll just quickly give out some instructions for the participants of the workshop. Please do not switch your video and audio on until you are instructed to do so. Type your questions in the chat box and we'll relay them to the speaker as and when the speaker is ready. 
you can also raise your hand in the session volunteers will get to you uh, so that's it let's get started we really hope you enjoy the session over to you Akshay. dr sandhya you can get started so okay thank you everybody for coming it's kind of i know kind of difficult to do this online and it's really amazing that uh, Ravi's students and lab have put this together in such short notice. So let me get started. Um, although I, although this is a science talk, it's a science light talk. And what I thought I would uh, illustrate at each point is how live imaging led us to make certain conclusions, which hitherto would have not been possible. So. If any of you have done any sort of imaging, and I often tell this to my own students, um, you can get a lot of data, but that's not a given that you will get insight into the biological problem. So despite your ability to acquire a lot of data and to analyze it, it does not always lead to something that you're looking for. In fact, imaging of any sort has the ability to seduce you into thinking that you're generating lots of data without promoting any understanding. So it's a lot of hit and miss, it's a lot of trials, and I thought I would start that up front um, because I often notice that in my own lab, when students first start doing imaging, they really get excited because you're getting a lot of data. And then as you go ahead, you realize, oh, you know, yeah, we got this data, but it doesn't really tell us anything. And as uh, my introduction said, all of this, I had not done uh, imaging as either a grad student or as a postdoc. Of course, I had done lots of microscopy. And in fact, I should say that um, I decided to choose C. elegans, which is this little critter here, because I wanted to do live imaging. So I, when I chose my postdoc, and I attempted on my own to set it up when I was a postdoc, but was not very successful. And I want to give, a, I want to thank John Scully, whose lab I visited for 10 days, um, and my own postdoctoral mentor, Mike, who, who, uh, paid for my ticket and I paid for my stay. And I said, John, I just want to come and see how you're doing it because he had published one paper on doing live imaging in worms. And I said, I just want to see what you're doing and what your techniques are. And I want to see how you do the analysis. So those 10 days gave me a little bit of a glimpse as to what the problems were. And then when I set up my own lab, a couple of years after that, with the help of my students and the imaging facility, which was at NCBS, we were able to set up a full fledged imaging component of our research program. Okay, so with that little introduction, I. Okay, so what my lab works on, or one major part of what my lab works on, is synaptic vesicle biogenesis and trafficking. So synaptic vesicles or several of these proteins are present actually on a membrane associated proteins that pass through the Golgi. And these vesicles, various proteins which are present on them, you'll hear today about synaptobrevin and RAT3 uh, briefly, and but we also look at others. Uh, for instance, we look at synaptogyrin, which I think uh, Shravanti may cover in the afternoon when she teaches, you know, talks about how to do analysis. Many of these proteins are sorted into compartments. And what seems to hold true for every sort of synaptic uh, vesicle carrying protein, at least in the C. elegans model. And in fact, I would go so far as to say is in most other model organisms, it has been looked at is it depends on the kinesin motor called unquanophore. This motor cargo complex enters the axon and not the dendrite. So you have polarized trafficking. This motor cargo complex walks on microtubules, hops off from microtubules, gets back on and ends up to the end of a microtubule track, comes on to another track, comes to the synapse. We showed that actually the motor falls off or likely to fall off, we think. The vesicles dock and release neurotransmitter. This entire process of supplying synaptic vesicles and membrane proteins to the synapse, it seems to be very essential. When this process is, doesn't occur properly, uh, which you have in certain hereditary diseases, um, you find that there are 
neuroperiphery neuropathies that develop. In addition, these sorts of transport processes seem to be affected either as a consequence or at least correlate with several neurodegenerative diseases. So there are plentiful reasons, both basic biology as to how you put together a vesicle which has a very defined composition at the synapse, but does not appear to have this sort of defined composition in the beginning, how all of these various components recruit the same motor, and how does it exit the cell body. So in this vast array of steps that I described, what my lab has attempted to understand and is I am really interested in is in what are the processes and genetic mechanisms that regulate these multiple strips and is there any biological significance is that does it influence some sort of behavior some sort of developmental processes and none of those are things which I'm going to show you today this is much more tuned towards showing why image analysis and acquisition of these sorts of data is very very important for advancing biological understanding. So briefly, the mainstay of our lab is genetic analysis. We do a lot of genetic screens, or we have done lots of genetic screens. And in fact, our most recent one was actually an RNAi screen, which in, in a sense is also a genetic screen. We use, of course, the model C. elegans because of its excellent genetics, but also because you can do live imaging in intact living animals, which is very important. And this sort of live imaging tends to give you a lot of quantitative data. And this sort of quantitative data is something that you can, which we have worked with Kalka Menon, who was in IMSC, I should update that, he's also at Ashoka University. And if any of you have looked at anything about COVID, he's on every television channel that I can ever, I even knew existed. And I think some which I didn't know existed. Uh, so he's, he's a, He's a theoretical physicist and he calls himself a biophysicist, but essentially what he does is models data where you can take that quantitative data and do some modeling and show a tiny fragment of how that kind of data can be used in our attempt to develop accurate imaging to reflect what happens inside the organism. We develop microfluidic devices, some by ourselves, some with the late uh, B. Venkat, uh, with Venkat was a uh, who was the chair of the physics department at ISC. And we have attempted to do, and this I will not touch upon, is developing new tech, you know, developing technologies for doing things in vivo. And essentially what you do when you have access to imaging types of platforms or can develop them yourself, um, the first thing that you do is whether it's applicable to your question and then go on from there. I should emphasize here that many people assume that doing live imaging requires high-end confocal microscopes. Um, I hope, Shravan, so that that need not be the case. You can also do imaging in just uh, very simple epitopes and microscopes. And what we've shown you here, this last bit, and I'll show you one piece of data here, which is a laser axotomy-based transport assays where we cut the neuron inside the animal. We can actually use that buying a double laser for some something like six, seven lakhs and attaching it to an epitoresin microscope. So at every point when you look at this kind of technology and you look at papers and you see some very fancy stuff there, there are some times when fancy equipment is necessary, but there are other times when free software and simpler ways of putting it together are definitely make, uh, definitely possible and therefore widens the scope of what kinds of things you can do in your own labs when you set up, right? Because it's not necessary that every person will be in the most resource-rich environment possible. And sometimes you would like to advance the science without, you know, constantly being held back by equipment. So you should keep that in mind. And many of the things that spirit has always informed the kind of work that I've done. And uh, we have relied less on high end equipment in some cases and really on simple things that especially in the early years, which we did not have access to some of these high end confocals, we were actually doing a lot of imaging and a lot of sort of simple stuff. Uh, using um, just a nice camera. And in fact, recently we saw that that was again possible, which really is very nice for us to have figured out. Okay, so the question we set out to ask, our biological question that we set out to ask is, how do you make a transport competent carrier? 
And we set out to do that by doing a genetic screen. And the reason is that this was my reasoning when I started that when you make a synaptic vesicle or a precursor of a synaptic vesicle, which is what was thought to happen, and now me, we, and others have shown is indeed what happens. You have these multiple diverse precursors that come out from the cell body. One thing was absolutely clear that the motor was required for transporting, the motor ANC-104 or KIF-1A invertebrates was required for transporting all of these compartments. Since that was the case, I reasoned that any other mutation which allowed you to be able to let this cargo exit from the cell body, this diverse sets of cargoes exit from the cell body, must phenocopy ANC-104, must look exactly like ANC-104. So in ANC-104 mutants, what you saw was you would not have synaptic vesicles at the synapse. Instead, they would be stuck in the cell body. But numerous people had done many genetic screens using synaptic vesicle proteins, and they had found, I think when I started my lab, none, and then soon after I started my lab, one molecule which phenocopied, one mutation which phenocopied ANC-104. So that immediately suggested that the mutations in other genes likely did not have strong phenotypes or would have strong phenotypes only in concert with ANC-104. So having that spirit in mind, we decided to do modifier screens. We did both suppressor genetic screens and enhancer genetic screens. And one of the molecules that we cloned from our suppressor screen was the molecule, and, and I'll skip this, was the molecule known as GYP3 or ANC-104, which is a MAP um, kinase scaffolding molecules, and it scaffolds all three MAP kinases. In fact, it ended up being a rabbit hole into which we fell, where we looked at the synaptic vesicle, but we look at the role in motors. And more recently, we uh, just had a paper accepted where uh, we look at its role in regeneration. So here is how a wild type neuron looks like when you're assessing two different cargoes. And I'm not going to tell you the rationale why we came to this experiment, except to say that it had been shown by Ishi Jin's labs that multiple proteins were mistrafficked in, in, um, in ANC-16 or JIP3 mutants, the same thing that we saw. And given the history of where we got it from, which was a suppressor screen of ANC-104, we asked what was the nature of the compartments which contain synaptic vesicles coming out from the cell body. So here we are doing, and this was in fact our first attempt at doing dual color live imaging, which is much more routine now. I think we do it in a weekly basis where Madhushri was a master student, looked at JFP rat 3 a synaptic vesicle marker, and Manasides 2 M cherry, which was tagged to, uh, uh, which basically marks the goal. I want to emphasize a couple of things here because all of us do these kinds of transfection kind of experiments. So in at least in our lab, we attempt to make sure that every marker that we develop recapitulates what is known about endogenous protein distribution, can rescue phenotypes, because what you do when you look at trafficking types problems, if things are vastly overexpressed, they can end up in compartments that are perhaps not the ones that you're interested in marking, and that is nothing to do with the gene that you're interested in investigation investigating. Right? So these are caveats which you have to keep in mind, which are biological caveats because it will overflow into imaging analysis. And you know, I can list you stories of rabbit holes that we have fallen down through and the difficulties we have faced when we've not taken care of these issues or we think pairs of markers would behave a certain way and then we realize that doesn't happen. So these are the and, and as we go through the talk, and especially when you go through the afternoon uh, analysis session, imaging types of experiments are well worth setting up extremely thoughtfully. Because not only of the time that you will need on the microscope, which is often a common resource in many labs used by many people, leading to competition for said resource, but the data that you get is laborious to analyze and takes often a lot of time unless you're very lucky and you can automate all its steps. So it's well worth thinking carefully about what is the data you're going to get from it and therefore what questions will you be able to answer.
In this case, it turned out to be a very good choice, where if you look at Synap Synapto, uh, if you look at RAP3 and Manosidase2, what you will see in wild type is one, this one big yellow tube, which has both the synaptic vesicle and the Golgi resident enzyme coming out from the cell body. And then you'll actually see when it loops back again, it'll go back. Right. And majority of the vesicles that are coming out and moving in the axon are really just RAP3 vesicles. It tells you that RAP3 proteins are separated from Golgi resonant enzyme proteins. Now, when you look at our mutant on 16, what you can apparently see is everything looks yellow and everything is moving together. Now, I think. What you take with these movies, and it's the mainstay of analysis, you do what are chymographs, and you make chymographs are essentially distance on one axis and time on the other axis, and these are the two, this is distance versus time, where you can track any signal that you want over time. So if you take a movie such as this, where you have things moving, you draw a line along, what you will end up getting is these little chymographs where you will see a slanted line is a moving line. Uh, this is a slowly moving vesicle, which becomes largely stationary. This is a vesicle that doesn't move at all. This is in the RAP3 um, channel. This is synaptobrevin, which is another synaptic vesicle marker. And then you can track each particle and you can figure out how much overlap you have. So doing these sorts of experiments, and here we are looking at RAP3 and synaptobrevin for these chymographs, but you could think of them for manosidase too. What um, Madhu figured out, what Madhu figured out was that compared to wild type in UNG16 movies, which was was apparent even when you saw the movie, close to 100% of the RAP3 compartments also carried manosidase too. So that tells you that in this mutant, there were sorting defects and exclusion of Golgi resident enzymes did not take place. In addition, what Madhu was able to do by doing a dual color imaging between RAP3 and synaptobrevin, for which the chymographs I just showed last time, she was able to show that in UNG16, the co-migration of RAP3 and synaptobrevin had dropped compared to wild type. That told you immediately that proteins that usually travel together did not travel together as frequently as they did in wild type in this mutant. So we call that sorting defects where you have errors in exclusion, where you cannot throw out Golgi resident enzymes, or errors in inclusion, where you're not able to keep things together. Essentially, in this mutant, the ability to make a gated community of a vesicle had broken down. So, of course, the simple the question when you're a biologist you ask is, how does this happen? How does JIP3 control the composition of the synaptic vesicle protein? And there were multiple reasons why we looked at LRK1, which is a mutation, which is an ortholog of the human LRRK2 gene, which is mutated in Parkinson's disease. And what uh, Madhu uh, her, Madhu's analysis showed of her movie showed that in LRK1, there were no exclusion defects. You know, they're very, very similar to white type that most of the vesicles that came out did not have uh, the Golgi resident enzyme present with it. And when you made, however, when you made double mutants, you saw that that was very, very similar to JIP3 or UNG16 mutants. This is one strand of evidence which suggests that LRK and JIP3 act in the same pathway. But this is for exclusion. What happens with inclusion? And what you see with inclusion is the following, that like JIP3 or UNG16 mutants, LRK also had half the number of vesicles that were co-transporting together. And you see all of this data is quantitative. It's not an all or none effect. And we have to pick up over here fairly large differences. But as we have used this assay further in another context, you have to be able to pick up much smaller differences. Therefore, putting highlighting the accuracy of analysis that is necessary uh, from these kind of live imaging experiments. And I think Shravanti will show you some of that um, later today as too. And it's it's sometimes quite time consuming to learn this. But I think at the end of it can be very rewarding because you get data of this nature, which allows you to say, OK, what we now see is that LRK acts downstream of UNG16 and inclusion has plays no role in exclusion. And 
Therefore, we have a genetic hierarchy, which we set up wanting to identify. We, then Nina, who was a postdoc in the lab, took that one step further. For those of you who are in um, have done basic cell biology, you know that the adapter protein complex, which is a clathrin based adapter protein, is very important for sorting as well as formation of vesicles, which are clathrin dependent vesicles from both endomembrane compartments as well as on the plasma membrane. Nina looked at the APB3 mutant, which is part of the AP3 complex, and what she showed was that in UL16 mutants, you have these uh, phenotypes where you don't have inclusion taking place, where synaptoprevin and RAP3 do not travel together as frequently. In this mutant, when you flood the system with LRK, you can actually restore the sorting to wild type, in that now very many more uh, RAP3 and synaptoprevin vesicles travel together. But this is dependent on the AP3 complex because in this animal, if you remove the APB3 gene, what you see is that you bring it back, make it look like UNG16. And as you see, the entire reasoning to illustrate this point is quantitative. We don't have any other means to come to this data. And this is why, again, image analysis, which is what this workshop is hoping to uh, share with all the people who have registered for this, is an example of how you can use quantitative data, which comes from live imaging, to draw conclusions. Okay, so I'll go back and show you. So what I showed you over here is doing dual color uh, live imaging and looking at extent of overlaps using chymographs. I'll talk about another phenotype that you see in UNG16 mutants. So I've described one set of phenotypes, which is that you have sorting defects where you lose exclusion as well as inclusion and LRK being downstream of UNG16, uh, permitting exclusion to take place, but not able to support inclusion. Okay. So here is a wild type movie of here was early days, which was this was done by Picasso, a student who was in, in with me in NCPS, and we used to do single color imaging then. And you can see these vesicles that move along the axon, they're tiny pinpoint vesicles. So let's be played once more, just size delimited. Now I'm going to show you one of Picasso's movie. Uh oh. I don't know why it doesn't play, but what you would have seen. All right, I give up. Um, what you would have seen was large tubes coming out from the cell body, but hopefully this one works. This is an LRK movie, and you can see these large tubes move along the axon. So let's go over it again. Here's a large tube. Here's another slightly larger tube. It'll Here's one. Right. And this was something that you could see very apparently. This particular movie comes from Nina, but the experiment was initially done by Picasso, who also showed that the same phenotype was present in UNG16. So again, you can go back to the chymograph analysis. And what you would see in wild type is these kinds of sloped lines. And what you see in LRK, for instance, you see this wide tube. And because you have this white tube, you can actually do quantitation of the length of the vesicle. And that is, although not the most accurate um, analysis that you can make, obviously, if you can make do the diameter, uh, which would be much better, and that's usually done by electron microscopy. Uh, but nonetheless, there are errors that keep in. Nonetheless, despite the caveats, and there are numerous caveats over here that you yourselves can think about, you will realize that having this sort of chymograph analysis allows you to get a reasonable approximation of some of the largest vesicles that move in these mutant backgrounds. So something which is apparent to see in a movie can now be quantitated. And we took advantage of that to do the following experiment. You had in wild type, you have a small number of tubes which are larger in size, which are length longer than 0.6 microns. What we saw in UNG16 mutants is that these were pretty large. 
you know, there was a much greater fraction of vesicles which were large in size. And you would see the same thing with LRK, even though I'm not showing it to here, showing it to you right here. You take this mutant and much like the sorting experiment, you flood the system with LARC, which acts downstream of UNG16 or GIP3, and you completely abrogate this phenotype. And now you get all normal sized vesicles. You have very few, you know, very small number of large vesicles. Again, going back to the adapter protein complexes, right now, not to AP3, where we did not see a phenotype. You can see that obviously in the movies because this was so striking. You instead, you look, we looked at AP1, which is actually important in dendritic sorting and hitherto had not been thought of as being important for synaptic vesicle trafficking at all. And what we saw when we looked at this particular animal, which had LARC flooded into it and now took out the AP1 complex by having a mutation in the mu submit of AP1, you now started seeing large tubes again. So that told us that the AP1 complex was very, very important for controlling the size of the carrier, which left from the cell body and might therefore determine how many, how much there, how much neurotransmitter could be filled into these carriers if they retain their size at the synapse. But this was independent from the AP3 complex, which actually controls sorting. And again, as you see, the sort of analysis comes from doing live imaging and quantitation of chymograms. And we could not have made this conclusion in any other way. Okay, so what we actually saw is a little bit of a, you know, developing the story a little bit, again, illustrating a point of how, you know, simple live imaging can be used. Is LRK actually promotes the presence of the AP1 localization on the Golgi. And here you can see that experiment very clearly. And many of you would have seen these kinds of images under epifluorescence yourselves or had an opportunity to look at it in papers. In wild type, you see that the AP1 complex, this is again the mu submit hooked to GFP, is present on what we know that these puncta are Golgi. When you start looking at GIP3 mutants, it's extremely apparent that this is completely disruptive. <coughs> but note how, oops. Note how disrupted this image looks, but look at when you quantitate it, it drops, it's significant, but the ratio, what you're looking at, mean puncture intensity to cytosol, which is one way that Madhu decided to express it, you see that that doesn't change very much. And this is something also to keep in mind as to how you represent your data, and hopefully Shravanti will, and Vedur will also cover that. If you look at LARC, it's not as severe as uh, the phenotype is not as severe as wild type. But when you take this animal and now overexpress LARC, you can drive uh, AP1 back to the Golgi uh, complex. And we did a little bit of biochemistry to show that inside the worm, uh, LARC and GIP3 were present together. I won't go into that because this is really a talk less about the science and more about illustrating the principles of image analysis and how you use that to gain insights into biological pathways. So it was again this kind of analysis which led us to go beyond what were just images to sort of put a number on it. And I can tell you from further experience that small changes in levels of localization is incredibly difficult to spot. And we are still struggling with sort of optimizing these pipelines. So I think as an experimenter, you continue to learn as your data becomes more complex and more diverse. Okay, so what we learned from that story, and even though I do not present all the data, it's published, and so you can read it if you're interested. In wild type, you have defined size of vesicles, which have a defined composition. For instance, the vesicles that come out from the, uh, from the cell body have FRAP3, they have synaptobrevin, they have synaptotagmin, and they are under the control of unc 4 in GIP3 mutants, our study showed that these vesicles that come out are larger in size. They have manosidase 2, synaptotagmin, and synaptobrevin, and seem to depend on a large number of motors. LRK acts downstream of GIP3 and doesn't have as profound uh, sorting uh, and trafficking defects, where here you're able to exclude manosidase 2, um, but you're not able to put RAP3 and synaptobrevin present together, and you're not really, you're, you're not able to recruit, we think we're not 
you're not able to recruit the motor well, and therefore your dependence on the motor is sort of reduced. But what was very striking and sort of strengthens the upstream downstream relationship genetically is that when you have GIP3 mutants and you overexpress LARC, you come, you take this profoundly missorted vesicle and you make it more normal. You make you can now throughout man of series two you get something which is more normal size you're able to put rap three and synaptogrevin together you're able to recruit some amount of motors there's still some errors over there they don't do as well as wild type in terms of being able to be motor dependent and nonetheless you can take a profoundly missorted vesicle and make it normal just by overexpressing luck so all of these studies and all of these insights that you're looking at predominantly come from doing quantitative analysis of live imaging. And so, you know, that sort of uh, um, the role of LARC seems to depend on both the AP1 complex and AP3 complex, where AP1 controls size and AP3 controls composition. We also looked at polarized trafficking, but since we were not doing live imaging and quantitation there, I decided to leave it out of the door. Okay, so we learned something about what happens in the cell body and what, you know, what are the steps in the cell body which decides what kind of synaptic vesicle precursors come out into the axon. Of course, one of the questions you would have is how do you maintain cargo flux in an axon? And this is important not only to understand in and of itself, but also because the idea that you have traffic jams and in neurodegenerative diseases, transport is affected. Is an, has been an integral part of the field for you know a couple of decades, if not more, I would say probably three decades. Um, and if you actually forget about the health aspects of looking at this biological questions and you just sort of peel off the plasma membrane of the neuron of the axon, you see it's an incredibly crowded environment. And in fact, um, the most elegant experiment I know comes from Frank Perez, who sort of induces trafficking in non-neuronal cells, removes the cytoskeleton, uh, which is all the actin and all the microtubules. And he would see that it would take 20 minutes and the vesicles will still diffuse and reach the cell surface and the proteins will reach there. It will never happen in a neuron. You can wait till kingdom comes and the animal will be dead and your cargo is not going to reach the synapse. And I think it's partly because it's a very, very clouded environment. Diffusion is not sufficient to supply the synapse. As you know, this, the crowding comes from multiple sources. There, of course, cargo. There's, you know, all of these kinds of cytoskeletal elements. There's actin-rich rings present. So... <laughs> This project got started as a collaborative, started in a completely different way, but I'll just sort of show you some things which led to some of our imaging adventures. Here was an animal which was in a microfluidic chip that we trapped. So let me sort of play it again. Here's an animal which is moving around in a microfluidic chip. We're going to trap it. This case turn on the laser, but I should assure you that this marker will work beautifully in epifluorescence and you would see uh, vesicles move in both directions and you also have stationary car cargo that don't move at all. When we when I started doing these experiments routinely in my lab and we started doing live imaging, we were never sure what we were looking at was really reflected what was happening inside the animal. Because we started off like I had seen John Spoley do using anesthetics. And in fact, Chika, who was working at that time as a JRF in my lab, did this series of experiments when we decided to develop a microfluidic device in which we don't use any anesthetic, right? And it ended up being a deep dive into um, you know, figuring out whether we are doing the experiment right. But, you know, we got a paper out of it. I don't know how much insight we got, but it was still actually a lot of fun to figure this out. So here's what is one of the drugs that we commonly use, which is levamisole or tetramisol, and that's the number of particles that move per unit time. These were all the different, uh, and, you know, Anesthetics we tried, we tried tricane, we tried propanol, we tried musimol. There's various things that people had tried. Um, 
we just tried the device by itself to see how the flux was. Then we looked at uh, the device with, with levamisole. And basically, we looked at the whole gamut. But what was very, very, very clear right away was that anesthetics have strange effects on transport. So some, like levamisole, can increase certain kinds of transport. Levamisole seems to be the best that we can do. Some, like tricane, reduce anterograde transport and upregulate retrograde transport. So it's not even proportional. Um, two propanol would make the animal really sick, and we were never, never, we could, you know, we would never, you know, it would have effects on the retrograde transport differently from anterograde transport. Musimol would jack up anterograde transport. So we realized by looking at this, and we knew that some of these was due to the device, it's uh, due to the anesthetic itself. And it was particularly pernicious when we started looking at young animals, especially young mutant animals. So here's a very simple experiment. UNC-104 is a mutation in the kinesin. So you would see very few particles moving in the axon. In fact, when we looked at levamisol, we would see in, in L1 animals, is very, very young animals, we would barely see any movement at all. We have to do something to the tune of 20, 30, 40 movies to get a couple of them, we will see some amount of movement. Unlike that, when we put that animal in the device, we would see robust transport taking place. Still not a lot, but you would still see robust transport taking place. And we knew that this effects were due to levamisole because when we treated the animal with levamisole and put it back in the device, we realized that transport was attenuated. So as you will see, we took a lot of care to figure out whether we were treating our animals right. There's nobody else who had done it before us. So we were not sure. We could have very simply said we're going to compare mutant and wild type, and that would have been sufficient. Except we had no idea when we looked at the mutants if they would, you know, mucimol, for instance, is something that is involved in neurotransmission in the GABAergic pathway. So now if you're looking at things which affect the synaptic nervous system and synaptic vesicles, should you be worried about these sorts of drugs or not? Especially, you know, some of the drugs had been used levamisole, including levamisole, had been used for doing genetic screens and trying to identify genes which were resistant to it with the idea to probe nervous system function. So what we learned from this three-year exploration with Sudeep Mondal, who was a, who had done his PhD in, in, in of science and physics and developed our microfluidic chips in my lab, was that yes, anesthetics have effect. We have to use anesthetics with care. And for really, really important experiments, we should probably use microfluidic devices as and when necessary. And we have continued to do that as and when necessary and sort of validated the use of these sorts of approaches to collect data. It doesn't change your analysis, but it does, it becomes very important in how many artifacts you introduce in collecting data. But regardless, however these movies are acquired, either using anesthetics, which is our more typical method, or microfluidics, which we do sometime. In fact, there's somebody in the lab trying to acquire that kind of data for looking at long-term imaging of mitochondria right now in the lab. And what you see with these movies is you see vesicles, as I said, moving in both directions, and a large number of vesicles which are stationary. We had seen in the lab doing analysis, and here let me tell you two stories. The first story is how we ended up learning how to do analysis, right? And you see this very complex series of lines, and you know, how do you draw a sloped line precisely on this? How accurate do you need to be? Do you take these smaller run lengths? Do you think of these as stationary? Do you take these little jiggles? Do you not? So initially, when we started off, we, you know, because who was the one who was setting this up, we'd say, okay, just look at the big ones. Just look at the ones which have long run lengths, and then let's look at what we see. Let's look at averages. Then he would annotate a chymograph one day, he would come back the next, and he would see five more particles. I would see five others he had not seen. So we had to develop this entire pipeline of deciding which was a real vesicle, which wasn't a real vesicle. And we quickly figured out that looking at the chymograph and going back to the movie was a lost cause because there were so many vesicles moving. It was very, very hard to spot what exactly wouldn't confirm it with the movie. It also told us issues of focus were critical if you wanted to get high quality data. Speed was important because the speed would decide 
you know, how much signal you would get, because if you went too fast, you get very little signal uh, with the camera settings that we had. Or if you went too slow, then you would miss events, short events like reversals. And there was a time when we did all of this annotation. And I remember Roop uh, had visited NCBS and we, I dragged him to the lab and said, I know you do you I know you don't do the same kind of analysis, but just you know, I'm just going to run it through you and see what you get. So I remember me and because uh, you know, and he was very kind to spend some time where we went through what we were doing, how we were marking, and things of that nature. Looking at where we are now, where we now mark every single vesicle and everything, we were so naive then. Uh, and even now, when I look at people and I look at other people's data, which they publish, and at least in the worm field, um, I can assess quite well. I see so much that they miss and they don't do. And, you know, when people come up to you in meetings and they show you, say that, you know, there's so much more information in these movies than you have managed to extract. So it was a learning process for us to recognize this. And I, ha I have a tremendous debt of gratitude here to give to Gautam, because when we were showing these movies to Gautam, because we were cha seeing changes in number of vesicles that were moving in different parts of the neurons, he turned around and said, what's all this stationary stuff? Why are these black lines there? And I get saying, well, everybody sees it. There are always vesicles that are stationary. You know, who knows? Maybe there's no microtubule there, or maybe the motor has fallen off. It's not important. After about the fourth or fifth or sixth, or I don't even know, the tenth time he told me, I really felt actually a bit ashamed that, you know, I couldn't give him a satisfactory scientific answer. So we started this entire collaboration, which I'll briefly mention. And again, I will emphasize that this comes out of doing very careful quantitative analysis of chymographs. And now you can see over there, we did the chymographs to look at sorting questions and size questions. And here we are looking at individual vesicle behavior in wild type. So there's no comparisons at all. It's all comparisons are internal in wild type. Uh, there are a few manipulations, but I think it will tell you what the power of doing this kind of work has the ability to give you some insight into what are biological processes that underlie these. We should say that we have tried and had only limited success at automation. Uh, there was a there was an MTech student who worked with uh, uh, signal processing and Im image analysis PI in IIT Madras, and she spent, I think, a good almost a year physically in my lab, and she would come back and forth between Chennai and Bangalore, and uh, we sort of, I think there is some conference, that's the way those people do it, there's a conference publication, and we realized that only the best movies could be automated, and even then they were missing a lot of lot of the data and so there's and so what we had to do was a semi-automated steps nowadays people in my lab write their own code they write their own image J plugins where they have to manually annotate what is there which is time consuming and then they run the code to sort of extract to do the so you don't have to do the counting but that's as far as we got we've not gotten uh, and so far as i know nobody has been really successful in the field and getting uh, this fully automated stuff done. We did attempt and we have not succeeded. And you can look at the conference paper if you wish to see how far we got and what approach we used. Um, but this is still quite complex at automation. It would be nice if it could be automated, but it isn't. Okay, so what was obvious is to ask the question, where is it that cargo piled up, right? Because you see all these cargo piled up at various spots. Her first insight came from when, again, uh, Kausalya was a postdoc in the lab, did this calculation where and where she would say, okay, cargo has piled up, the vesicles will disperse from there, and new cargo will come up and pile up. Do they pile up at the same place? Do I pile up some elsewhere? And she would see that 40% of the cases, they would pile up in the same place, suggesting there's something underlying in that location which might actually lead to this stationary, uh, you know, leading to vesicles being stationary. And that led first to Kauselia and then Parul, actually these are all Parul's experiments, to look at uh, actin. Parul was a PhD student in my lab. 
who to look at to see what are the cytoskeletal features which are present. So again, we went back to dual color imaging. We would do this dual color imaging and we would align the chronographs because they come from the movies. And what you can see is that you have this actin rich region and right beside it, you have some kind of stationary vesicle. Here's another actin rich region. This is not the best marker, but it's still a pretty good marker just coronin and you would see that juxtaposed to it there was stationary cargo so you can sit and quantitate all of that and what you essentially saw was our best markers it doesn't matter whether we looked at drosophila so by this time we were also doing drosophila imaging we can do drosophila live imaging in microfluidic chips or of course the conventional dissection method that also works um in in both cases we saw that vesicles were present in next to or juxtaposed to actin rich regions the next question is just because they are present there, that does not mean that they actually do anything. And these were experiments that Calcellia did, where she injected into the animal various concentrations of latrunculin, followed up by also by Parul's later experiments, where she saw that injecting latrunculin actually reduced active rich regions as marked by coronin or eutrophin. And what you see is that again, you lose stationary cargo. So you see that stalled vesicles seem to depend on stationary cargo. And here was an experiment which actually a reviewer asked us to go in with remarkably insightful uh, comment of his. What we saw in wild type animals is that, you know, there was a fraction of vesicles were moving, stations were stationary. When we injected it with the latrunculin, now you've dissolved all this actin. And instead of a vesicle coming and stopping and becoming trapped and become as a traffic jam, now you see that we think that they are moving, therefore the fraction of vesicles moving actually increases when you treat them with uh, something that dissolves actin. And again, that's quantitative data that comes from chymograph analysis. So we also found out that moving cargo, so the hypothesis that arose from it is that at actin rich regions, you have crowding taking place, and maybe this actin acts as a trap and traps vesicles. This is somehow, you know, like a stop sign in the axon where you can now get buildup of vesicles. So this led Parul to ask this question, and this is a very nice question that she asked. She said, what leads to the greatest number of stalled vesicles? And very simply, she broke this down. Again, this comes from dual color imaging, doing both actin as well as vesicles, where she said, if you don't have an actin enrichment or you don't have stalled pre-existing stalled vesicles, you actually see majority of the vesicles go through. That's like going on a highway. There's no problems. Now you have actin rich regions. And if you thought actin certainly played some role in trapping vesicles, yeah, it plays some role in trapping vesicles, but not a huge role. Majority of the vesicles still go. And this was what was really surprising and sort of brought forward the idea for us that, again, we're looking only at wild type animals, right? So you could see that that can be insightful or at least give us a direction to investigate where we saw that if you had stalled vesicles but they were not present in an actin rich region you now started stalling transport but if you had actin rich regions and vesicles present together you stall transport greatly right and we saw that both in c elegans as well as drosophila so that led us to conclude that physical crowding in neurons could play key roles in trapping and stalling vesicle movement, which had nothing to do with what motor was present on them. If that was true, you should find that vesicles will stall irrespective of what, you know, if it's physical forces, it doesn't matter if you have a truck in front of you or a Mercedes, you will still stop because there's no space on the road. Is that what you saw? And this was exactly also Parul's experiment where she saw that synaptic vesicles stopped at mitochondria, and endosomal vesicles stopped at synaptic vesicles, and it didn't matter whether they were moving in the anterograde or retrograde directions, very clearly showing that different kinds of cargo stall at the same location, consistent with the hypothesis that crowding could play key roles. And then Parul had another idea. So let's look at the flip side of the situation. We see where vesicles stall. Now let's take situations where these vesicles move away. Right, we're saying just having a truck in front of you or just having a Mercedes in front of you will lead to vesicle stalling behind you. Let's move them out of the way. Let these go away. And so she looked again at chymographs. Here, stalled vesicle, 
And here's another where the vesicle has moved away. And then she looks at how many vesicles can go through this region. And what she saw was that if the vesicle moved away, the flux or the number of the traffic through that region could improve. So very clearly, she showed that local flux regulation occurs where cargo are stored, again, consistent with your idea that there can be physical mechanisms to prevent cargo motion in neurons. And then again, this was Parul's idea. I should say that Parul brought lots of very nice ideas to this project. And she said that, okay, if you have physical crowding along the axon and you have a vesicle that moves, how far a vesicle moves is going to depend on how many obstacles it encounters and whether it stalls at them. So just naturally in the neuron, you can have densities of stationary cargo varying from as low as four and going as high as 15. And she just took advantage of what was normally present in wild type neurons. These are wild type healthy neurons and came up with a correlation which showed that the distance a cargo moved depended on the local density of traffic jams or stalled vesicles. So neurons are like Indian roads. If there's something in front of you and you can't get past it, you'll be stuck behind it and you'll have a small traffic congestion. So all of these experiments were inspired by, um, by discussions with Gautam and with close collaboration with him. But really the question you want to ask as a biologist is if traffic jams are present in healthy neurons, we're not talking about disease neurons, we're not talking about neurodegeneration, we'll come to that, I'll show you a brief slide. What are the ways to overcome it? So Gautam's simulation model suggested that as long as a vesicle could either reverse, let's go back on its same track, or, and just watch this vesicle, this comes from his simulation experiments, his uh, student uh, Vinod, or you can change the road. This would be exactly if you're driving on an Indian road, you can either go back or go onto another lane, you will restore traffic. So we decided to test that. And here is a dual color imaging movie, which you're looking at actin in green, these are actin rich regions, and the red is a synaptic vesicle. And I'll play it from the beginning. And this is an unusual vesicle, okay? So I'll say that very few vesicles reverse as much as it did. And you can see that it's reversing, going forward, backward, going forward, sort of seem struggling to get through this region, and which has a big actin patch here. And then it finally will sort of come out on the other end. So these were experiments which were done by Kirtana, where she asked how frequently does a vesicle reverse? And where does it reverse? And in fact, she shows that <coughs> for synaptic vesicles, the reversals are slightly more away from stationary cargo compared to at stationary cargo. And I'm not going to get into a lot of this detail because it actually tells you you need a lot of careful camera graph analysis to do that. Typically, it takes a person about a month or two at least to learn it, if not more. And I hope I'm not running out of time, but there's, there's not a whole lot more to show at this point. What we could see is that what Gautam's model suggested was the following, which is that the number of stationary cargo, how much flux you have, and the reversal rate are related. So we looked at a Taupati as a crowding model, and we see essentially that, and I won't go into it. So what we learned from this set of studies, again, all quantitative analysis of live imaging of transport, that stationary cargo feature of axonal transport, multiple types of cargo stalled together, traffic jams occur in healthy neurons. We think physical crowding is critical for making these kinds of traffic jams occur and reversals might be key to relaxing or reducing the density of traffic jams in neurons. Okay. So the final thing which I'm going to come to is ongoing work, but I sort of talk about one technique where we used a nanosecond laser to cut neurons. And all of the data that I've shown you now are movies that we take for two, three minutes, sometimes five minutes, but no more than 10 minutes, right? Um, and that's typically what we do. But there are different timescales at which you can get data. And I'm going to show you one thing which 
which I was very, very keen to do. And I tried multiple times as a postdoc to do as well. There are these old assays, which will tell you, which was how actually axonal transport was discovered, where you tie a knot around the axon. This was, of course, done in huge vertebrates like rabbits and not a worm, which is one millimeter long. And then you wait for several weeks and you see where proteins flow, which proteins flow. So, you know, some proteins go only in anterograde direction. Some don't, uh, you know, some go equally between the two. So sort of telling you, trying to bridge the gap between what are dynamic properties which are in the minutes time scale to steady state distribution which occurs in the days time scale i think i've long wanted to bridge that gap i mean it was i was utterly unsuccessful in my uh, postdoc I, and that's a story in itself to laugh over you know a cup of chai not something to share in a talk um but one of the things that this was again because this experiment is part of jitendra's project where we were looking at uh, Again, a genetic screen and looking at how motor bound to cargo, where um, because did this analysis where he looked at a temperature sensitive UBA1 mutation and showed that the motor was actually getting degraded at synapses. If the motor was indeed getting degraded at synapses, it was flowing from the cell body to the synapse, delivering cargo, getting degraded, then your prediction would be very little will come back. And Particle tracking to this day of motors is painful if you have lines which are anywhere representative of what are in vivo levels. It's very, very difficult to do accurately. You have just the signal to noise is not good enough because there are very few motors on the cargo surface. You can do it very nicely with uh, cargo molecules because you can load up the cargo, especially cargo like wrap. Three, you can load up the vesicle with RAP3 and the vesicle is still probably going to retain its identity, but it'll give you nice signal to noise ratio in your imaging setup. But it's always been an issue for us with motor imaging. We've never really had very great success with it. But here was an assay which actually Sucheta developed with, uh, with my first collaborator in India at all, who's an engineer whose name was Kaus Tubra, who's now in Azim Premji University. And what we did was something very simple, which I'd wanted to do and I'd failed again when I was doing, said, okay, we can't tie the neuron, let's cut the neuron. So we used uh, laser axotomy and we cut it. And what Sucheta saw an hour later, was this motor accumulating from the cell body, but very little coming back. And when she blocked you, or when Bikas actually did this, some of these experiments, when you block ubiquitination, now you have motor accumulation, the synapse things would come up, come back up. But you realize again, you know, this is at a one hour time scale. We have the steady state distribution and what is missing is this very narrow window, which is happening right away. And here we had to wait for Vidur, who's a current graduate student and one of the people who's going to share, share, I think, this sort of analysis. And here's what he did, right? Now he's not using the nanosecond laser. He's using a more sophisticated system, essentially because it's integrated with the imaging. And here, you just cut it and you can see motor just accumulate. That's the cell body over here. At the same time scale, if you have soluble imagery, you don't see that. So let me play that once more. Cut. The motor accumulating. Cut. You don't see soluble evidence accumulating. So very, very early on, you see this anterograde bias because you're essentially the motor largely moves in the anterograde direction. It appears to move largely in the anterograde direction. And it's either walking or cargo. We don't know. We think it must be walking where it just sort of flows in very quickly and you can capture it at this time scale, you can capture it at the one hour time scale and potentially you're also able to see the signature of that in the steady state distribution if you do certain manipulations. But, oh, wow, I didn't know you could do that. This is Vidur's slide, okay, here. That's very nicely done. So what Vidur did, and this is really his work, and I probably do miserable justice to it in attempting to explain it. What he he did was to actually look at this early peak, early part where it's linear and say, okay, at what rate are you, you know, accumulating the motor at this point of time? And he can go into greater detail as to why he set up the analysis pipeline the way he did. And it's worth sort of looking at that because anytime you get fresh data, you sort of 
if you can convert these kind of movies to these kinds of curves, you can get a lot more information out of it. And it's a part of an ongoing collaboration which we are doing with two other physicists, Amitabha at IIT um, Bombay and Devashish, who's at uh, Institute of Physics at Bhubaneswar. But what um, Vidur's data shows is the following, right? You look at these early time scales. Here's your control RNAi, no longer looking at mutant, and you take your UBA1 RNAi, and then you see that the motor just sort of, when you have this degradation abrogated, you see a lot more water rushing into the cut side. Tells you that ubiquitination may, in fact, do something more than degradation and may modulate the motor. And he went on to do an RNAi screen, has been able to identify candidates, some of which which seem to affect what he thinks are processes in the axon, which are to do with motor movement and processes in the synapse, which is the way I actually often think about the pro uh, problem, which is degradation of the motor at the synapse. So quantitative data allowed us to expand our ability to understand what this single modification or is you know getting us to the point where we appreciate what the single modification might be doing much more than degradation at the synapse which is very nice uh, finding for vidur to have sort of started to make so very simply tying it all together we see that motors come to synapse we think that that degradation is actually probably very important to not have cargo competition and drag uh, motors back to the you know, drag garbage back to the synapse. So at least that's my favorite hypothesis. It could well turn out to be all rubbish. I do not know. So none of this would have been possible without a large number of students doing repeated analysis. I think I am, you know, sort of a persnickety. I'm very particular about how these things are done because so much of our data comes from numbers and we have to be very careful. Some of the early, the early live imaging was actually set up by Picasso who, was the first student in NCBS who started doing systematic live imaging, taking some of the things I had seen in John Scully's lab and said, okay, let's repurpose it here and see how well we can do that. And repeatedly analyzing the chymographs, same chymographs you analyze like 10 times, 15 times, 20 times till you're sure that what you're looking at is correct. Sudeep, who developed a lot of our microfluidic devices and led us really to appreciate you know, what anesthetics did and where we need to worry about them. Kausalya, who set up the early pipeline lines for analyzing stationary cargo, stop and go, which was developed further. And Shikha worked very closely with Sudeep looking at all the anesthetics. Madhushri did our first dual colored imaging systematically to address trafficking. Parul developed a lot of the early pipelines that Kausalya had. Parul sort of developed further and sort of came up with good measures, uh, which was then used by Kirtana. And the work was also for some of our sorting effects was done by Nina. Current students who are doing a lot of quantitative imaging is Shavanti, Vidur. Vidur has developed his own analysis pipeline and work which I've not done, which is looking at calcium imaging uh, and, you know, it's actually Vidur also set up our actin imaging uh, that uh, we were doing. Was it Vidur? No, it was actually Parul then followed by Vidur in a different con context. Um, so we do a lot of live imaging. We get a lot of quantitative data. It can be, you know, time consuming to analyze, but I hope I've shared with you today what are the insights you can get if you take these approaches to biological problems. And then that's really should be the bottom line of whether you decide to go this direction for any Thing at all. We've had lots of collaborators and really wonderful people we've worked with, both in the lab, my team, as well as outside the lab. This is a very nice logo that Madhu made a long time ago, and those are our funding sources. And I'm happy to take questions. It's sort of taken longer than I intended.
Thank you for the wonderful talk, ma'am. Am I I, I'm here? sorry, I did not. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, you are. And I'm sorry, I did not give you a science talk as you know, we found this, but I gave a more. Uh, you know, no, it was very topic. insightful. Yeah, please go ahead and ask questions. Yeah, anyway. a few questions. Uh, should we take them? Yes, please. We should. OK, uh, the first question is by Dr. Lakshmi. She asks, could you so please highlight on the number of images required for the quantitative data analysis that you presented today, like yeah. movies with dual color in Madhushree's work? OK, so uh, what we now do is the following. So when, when we're doing it, Madhushree, it was still early days. And I think one of the things that they sort of emphasize is the pipeline of analysis and your understanding of it develops over time. Um, so now routinely we look at 20 animals. We never do less than 20 animals. And I should say a couple of things. If you're doing cell lines or you're looking animals, make sure each time you are imaging your manipulated, you know, whatever your manipulation, it could be an RNA, it could be a mutant, it could be a drug. Every week do some wild type side by side because we have noticed that there is sometimes drift in the wild type. And what you thought it was wild type, you come back a year later, you will find that the numbers come out differently. So 20 animals, a certain minimum number of vesicles that are moving in each chymograph, that is going to depend on the cargo, right? So I'll give you another example. Synaptic vesicles in moving in one direction or the other, the ones that undergo reversal are very, very small proportion. So the number of events is also important. You don't want to take a movie which is very short in which you'll get one event because by chance you'll get two events in another movie and then you will say there's a 50% increase, which it is not. It's just a second event that you had. So you need to have, have some understanding of the frequency of the events that you are looking at to decide how many ends and how long your movies are. So that finally the conclusions that you draw are accurate. So for reversals, we said that the movies need to be at least, you know, three minutes to two minutes long. And we're going to do the simplest normalization. Just last week or the week before we had this extensive discussion. In fact, the participant is over here in this Amal where we're saying, should we be representing the data where we are representing it this way? Shouldn't we be representing it different? So this is an ongoing debate that you will have to figure out whether you are representing the data right. But I would never go less than 10 or 15, you know, even if it was a very simple experiment, just to be sure. Of course, if you have it's 10 or 15 and you have like, you know, 1000 events per chymograph, then yeah, sure, maybe five will do. But I would still look at the variation to make sure that there isn't a cell to cell variation or animal to animal variation. You may not analyze every chymograph, but you should definitely at least image 20, you know, 20 examples so that you know where you're at. Uh, okay, uh, the next question is, what is the rough size of your recycles that you had looked at? What was the what size? I'm sorry, can you say that again? What is the rough size of your recycles oh, that you okay. had looked at? Okay. okay, so the diameter, I don't recall it's there. We did EM on those vesicles, the diameter, is something to the tune of 50 nanometers but what we could what we didn't measure was the diameter with live imaging right because we can't because that's under the resolution of light and what we measured is the length where we say you know we can't even though your if you do an actual bead experiment even though they say 200 nanometers is your resolution you'll be able to get at you know certain wavelength we rarely we rarely try to measure so close to the resolution of the light of that particular wavelength and that lens. So if you notice, we said anything which is longer than 0.6 nanometers. So I think realistically we can image lengths of 0.4 nanometers. Uh, sorry, 0.4 micrometers. You know, about 40 nanometers we can do slightly fairly well. But I have much greater confidence when we start looking at. 60 nanometers and greater. 
it's really hard because then it becomes on how you draw that line and how accurate you're drawing that line is. So I think that is the reason, uh, you know, you have greater confidence when the objects are not terribly small. Anything which is done manually, you have to worry about that because there is going to be user error. And so typically when we have a new person getting trained, we get them trained on data sets that have already been analyzed to see event by event, how much error do they have? And for them to sort of really look closely at it to figure out how to do this analysis. Uh, the next question, do you also see trafficking defects of Golgi resident enzymes in other organelles such as late endosomes or lysosomes in the unk mutants? In, uh, in JIP3 mutants, we have not done that experiment. So I can't, I can't tell you, but I expect that to happen. I think retention is just lost and I think there's overflow everywhere. You know, what to me is really surprising is despite such profound trafficking defects, the animal is not dead. It's not, you know, it's relatively healthy. So, you know, sort of makes you wonder, you know, you put in so much energy to doing all this sorting and separating things. What is actually the cell achieving by this? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. I hope I have question is, uh, uh, as you said, the focus is important in getting the correct information during live imaging for track, tracking vesicle. Do you capture only a single plan or any Z stacks? So we don't need, so that's because that's because of the problem that we are looking at, which is we are looking at neurons and axons are very narrow. They are 300, 400 nanometers, so they don't even cross one plane, right? I mean, one reasonable plane where resolution on the z-axis is anyway not as good as the xy-axis. So we capture only one plane. When we have looked at the cell body and we've not done live, we still have to set up that, you know, Shravanti actually attempted that, then she changed directions. Then you will get a Z stack, and then you will have to incorporate that. I think why you should ask Vaishnavi because she I noticed that she's giving a talk later on, and she looks at cell body, and she might be capturing Z stacks, but it's going to depend on what kind of events you want. Are you looking at short events which you can capture in a single plane? Then you can just use that single plane, uh, or you're looking at events temporally which will cross planes. For us, it's not been an issue so far because we're looking at the axon, which is very narrow. But in principle, none of our analysis pipelines are restricted by that, right? We'll just have to tweak it, but it's possible to do. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, the next question is by Akshar. She asks, do you think these traffic jams at the actin-rich regions are important for exchange of cargo or molecules between the organelles? We don't know uh, because so essentially you are asking whether they retain their identity, right? Yes, we have certain so we I mean we've not looked systematically at it. I'll tell you what Parul showed me many years ago, and then you know. It's, it's something certainly that we should look at at some point. So when we look at RAB5 and RAB3, of course, you know that RAB exclusion is the is definitely something that occurs more commonly than does not. So maybe these are not the two best markers to look at. But if you look at RAB5 and RAB3 vesicles, they always seem to be discrete in that if a RAB5 vesicle stops and starts moving again, it does not seem to have mixed with, now it's not a yellow vesicle which is moving. So you don't get both of those present. Now we will not be able to always tell unless we bleach in one channel and look at the other uh, other channel, which we have not done, uh, to see if you know some of it is hopping on to another vesicle. We've not done those sorts of experiments. But it's certainly something that we should look at. So how much maturation occurs? Essentially, what you're asking is how much maturation or turnover or exchange can occur in the axon. And we don't know the answer to that. In the cell body, of course, you know, it's been reported, you know, the whole network of endosomal trafficking shows these arrows which go all over the place. But does that happen in the axon? Not clear yet. We haven't seen obvious examples of it. 
Okay, ma'am. So the next question from participant is, ma'am, how do you calculate the distance traveled by vesicle? Oh, so that's actually very simple. You just so you see the vesicle. You can track the vesicle, and as it causes stationary cargo, we continue we continue to say whether it's the same. If it's the same vesicle, if it continues to have the same slope and the same intensity, right? And with a large number of them too. If the slope or intensity changes, then sometimes we, you know, significantly, then we call it a different vesicle. Um, and so you look at the beginning of when it starts moving and look at the end of when it start, starts moving, which could be either a stop at a stationary cargo or a reversal or it goes out of the frame. If it goes out of the frame, you can only call it as greater than, right? Because you don't know when it started. Or if it's moving when you start the movie, then too you'll say greater than. But for a large number of vesicles, this line, the length of the line will decide how, will tell you how far is the vesicle moving. And you have to sort of annotate it. And then of course you have a scale bar with which you apply a conversion. So you have a pixel to micrometer conversion. Thanks for answering the question, ma'am. So the next question is, uh, does vesicle reversal involve change in the bound motor? If yes, are acting rich regions important for this reversal? Uh, so, obviously, vesicle reversal is going to involve motor which is bound to cargo, but also is able to walk on microtubules. What data I showed you is that there is a small bias in synaptic vesicles in C. elegans for actually a greater number of reversals taking place outside of actin-rich regions, not at actin-rich regions. That immediately tells you that actin may not play a very big role in doing reversals. And in fact, in ung 16 mutants, you don't have actin, very little actin rich regions, and you still have reversals taking place. And you still have stationary cargo taking place uh, present. So that clearly tells you that there are many sources of crowding, exactly like you would in an Indian road. No, one day you'll have a traffic jam because a truck broke down in front of you. Another you'll day have a traffic jam because five friends on cycles or motorcycles decided to sit and stand in the middle of the road and chat. The underlying principle is physical crowding leads to traffic jams. Which aspect of physical crowding for that particular group of vesicles is going to vary? And the same, I think, principle applies in neurons. Or at least that's the way I think about the problem. Um, another participant asks, do these trafficking jams occur in neurodegenerative disease conditions also? So what has been shown in neurodegenerative disease models um, is that when you do live imaging, you see a lot of cargo which is stationary. Um, you also see that reversal. So this is very old but very elegant, nice paper from Erica Holzbauer where she had dynamited mutants and she sees that what comes back from the synapse in dynamited mutants is reduced. So you had this link between neurodegenerative diseases as well as transport. And, but this could come from two things, right? It could come from what we are saying, crowding related in that you have jams taking place because, you know, some other cargo is accumulating over there and the motor is not able to get through that. Or you have some changes in signaling and these changes in signaling is what causes you know, some changes in transport mode, the motor gets inactivated. I think, or a third possibility is that it's your ability to do reversals, which is very important, or state changes is very important. So I would say the second and third are only subtly different from each other. I think after looking at our most recent data, I have some confidence in saying that we actually see, and I didn't go through that data, I'm sorry, because it was already getting late. We actually see a reduction in reversals precede an increase in stationary cargo. So that tells you that you could have changes in signaling and changes in transport properties, and you need these kind of reversals to take place to keep traffic moving. And you know, intuitively, actually, it makes sense. 
now we have Google Maps. So if you want to go from place A to place B, first you will look and say it's red. I'm not leaving the house. Now vesicles can't do that. No, they have to leave only. They, they doesn't seem to be a trap like system. If you're already on the road, you'll see which is the most optimum path I can take. Otherwise, you will try to go back and come back. So you have this temporal analysis of traffic jams. You say, let me go back. Let me go and buy those vegetables, fruits, or whatever ice cream I'll eat. I'll try the same place. Let's see if the jam is resolved. So that's what I think of as reversals, which is temporarily you sample the same niche to see if it has resolved. The other thing is spatial. That is, you step on to another lane and try to go past another way or use a diversion. So I think when those mechanisms break down, inherently you start getting many more stationary cargoes and maybe breaking down of those mechanisms is also one thing that neurodegenerative diseases uh, can do. At least that's my current thinking. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, the next question is from Rachita. If a cargo reverses back to release a uh, traffic jam, doesn't it cause aggregation of the vesicles behind? That's a very, you know, that's a very, very, very good question that you asked. Actually, if you look at the simulation, and we think the simulation captures major features of what we see in vivo, you actually see that it goes back quite a distance. But in our own movies, the vesicles don't reverse all that much. But nonetheless, in this crowding model, we see that reversals go down before stationary cargo accumulate. So maybe what's happening in vivo, this I have no hard evidence, but I'm just you know, sort of looking at the data we have so far, and it sort of jumps out at me, is what happens is vesicles move for a short distance and then you have temporal sampling because that local niche may have changed in some way. Maybe some more vesicles have emerged from the stationing cargo. So the extent of crowding is different. Maybe the vesicle can rotate a little bit and attach to another microtubule because these particular neurons have a lot of microtubules, so a lot of different tracks. It's not true for every neuron. It's This is most similar to what you see in vertebrate neurons. But it very rarely seems to be where it goes back and gets stuck again. There, it, it, it does occur, not that it does. It's a matter of chance. But in our simulation, that's not the way it happens because the places where you have traffic jams, which are at microtubule endpoints, that's the way it's simulated, are quite far apart from each other. Remember, I wanted you to think about it as a way of a temporal relaxation that, oh my God, I'm seeing a traffic jam ahead. So let me go back, park, go eat ice cream and come back. And maybe that traffic jam is released and I'll be able to go forward, right? So it's not the end of the world. So that's temporally you're sampling the same region to see whether you can eventually reach the destination. And you can probably tune that just by numbers of motors. So we actually find that anteriorly moving synaptic vesicles do very few reversals. Retrogradely moving synaptic vesicles again do very few reversals. So presumably there are very few active motors of the opposite direction on it. And so you just need this small proportion of vesicles doing these reversals to really make sure that flow occurs. Hypothesis anyway. Not that easy to test, but a hypothesis nonetheless. Um, the next question is, would you please comment that in a comparative study between wild type and mutant, how do you choose your time point of imaging? And for quantification, are those data taken at comparative time points or variable time points? So I, I don't know what Shravanti is doing right now, um, but we typically do L4, which is level stage four or one day adults. And we typically make about a two, three minute movie. So in that, they are developmentally at the same stage and we look at same length movies. Now, what you asked is a non-trivial question, by the way, and I'll tell you why it's non-trivial. Sometimes when you have, when you're doing comparisons between a particular condition, the number of vesicles moving can be very different from wild time. So it could be more, it could be less, and it could be very different very different in the sense that maybe what you see is what I described for synaptic vesicles, everything moving largely anterogradely. And what you might see in your mutant is now it's all moving bidirectionally, going back and forth and really not going anywhere else. Those are 
those are of course challenges for analysis and this is a reasonable first pass approach that we typically take we always express things as a fraction we, of course you want a certain minimum number of vesicles moving so just that you're not hit by the number of events i said you know you can if you have one event every mi minute and a half and you have a two minute movie and suddenly you have two events then you'll say oh it's doubled when it really probably has not doubled so you either need to have longer movies or you need much more different kind of sampling and normalization to really know what the frequency of that event is so once you cross that boundary of what you have set up as a minimum and that you do empirically and you might have to revisit that for a particular mutant but you do that empirically you know if i see some some 20 vesicles moving then you you're going to be likely to be okay it's not like one in you know one in 100 kind of very low frequency event then you say that uh, whatever I'm expressing, I'm going to express as a proportion of all the vesicles that are moving rather than absolute numbers. So then you don't, because if you're looking at sorting questions, you're look, asking to see what proportion of your vesicles are doing that rather than total vesicles. This would be different if you're looking at the role of that mutation on flux. Of course, for instance, in an unk mutant, you'd expect very few vesicles to move. Is that what you see? Which is why I said that there are times when live imaging can give you real insight. There are times when live imaging will give you consistent with your argument. And so there are times when live imaging will just give you data without leading you anywhere. And it is you as an investigator has to do, put your thinking cap on to figure out what is the exact experiment and analysis pipeline that you need to answer the question that you're interested in? I, I'll just take this question, which is I'm just seeing it. Can chymograph analysis include... So next question is... Just, uh, just, just, just a minute. Can chymogram I, analysis include... Co-localization or co-motility? Absolutely, it can. You can look at the details. Can in chymogram... Part. Yes, chymograph analysis include co-localization or co-motility. Co-motility is what I showed you, which is co-transport. It can also include co-localization because what is advantageous over there is that you have the temporal time scale as well. Please look at Parul Sood's paper in traffic where we have looked at actin and vesicles and vesicles of different kinds to do precisely this kind of analysis where we sort of take randomly selected boxes and over time to see how far the overlap continues over time and to come up with a metric for saying that if you cross this limit, then we can say that there we have a juxtaposition or a co-localization. It's not right on top of each other, but right beside each other. So please look at that. We have done that. And, and generally, papers from our lab have long detailed method sections, and that might be helpful. Thank you, ma'am. The next question, how can we say that the vesicle how can we say that is a vesicle since there are free proteins which are not associated with the vesicle? That's a very, very, very good question. And in fact, I sort of alluded to when we looked at the motor. We said that we've had a hard time doing really good, high quality motor imaging because there's so much soluble motor. So your signal to noise is very problematic. If you look at a transmembrane protein, for instance, like we did with uh, manosidase 2, or we looked at synaptoprevin, which I didn't show you a movie of, what, or Shravanti may show you synaptogyrin, which is a four transmembrane protein, that is membrane associated. So if you see that moving, you know it has to be cargo. The time scales of diffusion, and I don't know if Vidur will go into that, but you can certainly ask him that because that's one of the things that he tries to extract from his movies. The time scales of diffusion are much, much, much faster than motor dependent transport, right? So those time scales are very different. So anytime when we do particle tracking of this nature, it is highly likely that it is moving through some sort of cytoskeletal based transport process or is a discrete object 
that is moving. Of course, to get additional evidence for that, uh, you can do a variety of experiments, including manipulations of the motor itself to see if it is stalled or the cytoskeleton to see if it is stalled. So you will have to sense. And those were some of the old experiments that people used to do. Um, we will say, I will say one thing, right? So we, when we look at RAP3, so we've done photoconversion experiments where we have RAP3 hooked to Dendra2 and we bleach, uh, we photoconvert Dendra2 and see where that RAP3 ends up. Actually, Parul did those experiments. And we realized when we did those experiments that RAP3 was hopping on and off vesicles because we would, in a very, very small spot, photoconvert. But you know, 15 microns away, we will see a vesicle moving, which had now photoconverted RAP3. So, you know, the photoconverted RAP3 has fallen off the vesicle, diffused, got onto another vesicle and is moving there. Frustrating with the experiment she was planning, but that was in, convert, you know, that was proof that that was essentially what was happening, but tends to not happen as much with membrane drug, with membrane associated proteins for obvious reasons. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, there is a question on YouTube also. I will read it out. Uh, ma'am, how did you figure out which line in the chymograph belongs to which vesicle, whether it belongs to anterograde or retrograde vesicle? Oh, because you know where the cell body is. Right? When you're doing your imaging, we have this elaborate file naming system where we'll say animal number, cell body up, down, left, right, something they, you can ask, you can ask the... You can ask Shavanti and Vidur. So you know where your cell body is. So when you open it, you know where your cell body is. And from based on that, then you draw the chymograph in a manner in which if you draw it in a particular direction, then, you know, going left to right will be for us going from right to left. I have a problem with this. From right to left for us is anterograde, which is not typically what you see in papers. And from left to right is retrograde. So that depends on how you draw your chymograph. So you need that information as to where your cell body is. And that has to be hardwired into, at least in our lab, we put it right there in the file name. So you put the animal number, we put the date, we put or some folder. They'll tell you about how we save data. Those are all very, very important things that you need to know to sort of handle imaging data. Uh, we are closing the question answer session. Thank you so much, ma'am, for this uh, wonderful talk. And thank, thank you for you making patience. <laughs> thank you for making time for it. Uh, we will continue with the session after lunch break. Uh, we will start at two. So I ask all the participants to download all the data sets that were sent to you yesterday. Uh, there were two uh, data sets that were sent. So please download it before the session, afternoon session. And uh, Shravanti and Vidur will take over in the afternoon. Thank you so much. But please don't hesitate to ask them technical questions because, you know, Shravanti has really sort of taken our dual color imaging of co transport. Um, even looking at difficult, we've had lots of problems with our imaging system. And she can, I don't know if she's going to show you images, how you can also use epifluorescent microscopes for doing some of your analysis. And I think Vidur is also going to show you how you can write a little bit of, you know, how you can extract data from, you know, these soluble proteins and things that move around. So I hope you enjoy the rest of the session. Thank you. Thank you very much for your attention. Sandra, thank you so much. Uh, on a normal day, I would have invited you over for lunch. No, no, it has to wait. It all has to wait. I think your yeah, students have done an amazing job as usual. Thank you. No, no, no. It was very nice. I see a lot of students have asked questions and I know you like questions. So thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I mean, as I, I said, it was not a science talk. It was a technical. Right. Talk. So uh, I hope that you all gained something from it and it sort of informs your work as you go forward. Absolutely. So we look yes. forward for the afternoon session as well. I'll look, see you around. Thank you so yes. much for a wonderful time. Thanks. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Bye.